Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to 2024 Calvary Chapel Lemon Grove. Let's let's uh let's enjoy the Lord together. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you now, we're so grateful that you gathered us together. We pray for those that may still be on the road headed here, that you get them here safe. Pray for those that are out today, Father, uh, that wherever they are, that you would bless them, protect them. Um, and we just pray that even now you'd be working in us, Lord, to open us up for your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You join us in standing. We'll worship our Lord together.
I predicted with near 100% confidence that it was going to rain last night because I washed my car on Friday night, so. <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> it's my fault. <laughs> if you guys want rain, just let me know. I'll wash my car and that'll pretty much seal the deal. So um, anyway, we're glad you're here this morning. And it's our prayer that God would just bless you beyond measure, that he would give you exactly what you need this morning. Uh, out of his limitless treasures and resources. Uh, Michael's going to read Psalm 67. If you want to read along with him, that's where he'll be. Psalm 67. God be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on earth. Let the peoples praise you, O oh God. Let all the peoples praise you. Then the earth shall yield her increase. God, our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. Amen. And isn't that, in fact, what we are here to do today, to sing his praises, to worship him? So the, as you know, in line with that, the worship team is going to play one more song, and if you'd like to support what God is doing through your offerings, there's an agape box in the hallway. Bless you.
pray now that you would fill us with your word, give us a mind to understand what you have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. He is a good, good father, isn't he? Amen. And Lord, you are a good, good father. We just rejoice in you and the glow of your love for us. Knowing how little we deserve it, all we can do is express our gratitude. Thank you, Lord, for being here with us today. Be honored in our midst. Be honored by what you hear. Be honored by what you see. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So the last couple of weeks we've been doing, you know, more topical studies. And today we're going to get back to what we know and, and love best, and that is line by line, verse by verse teaching through God's word. So we get his whole counsel. Now, you might remember that uh, a couple of weeks ago, we left you with a bit of a cliffhanger in our study through the first half of Matthew chapter 24. And now that the holidays have come and gone once again, we're going to pick things back up where we left off. So please turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24, verse 27. But when you read passages like that, doesn't it make you glad you're on the right side of that equation? I mean, you're right with God, you have fellowship with God, you have peace with God because of what His Son has done for us. So, um, let's talk about the impending return of Jesus Christ, His second coming. So the first time, he, as you know, he came as a, a humble king, a servant king. Have you ever left the door open only to have someone, maybe it's your mom or your dad, ask you whether you were born in a barn? <laughs> well, Jesus was literally born in a barn. They laid him in a manger. Of course, it's a feed trough for animals. Not the beginning you might expect for the king of kings. What will the conditions be? What will it be like when he comes again? Matthew chapter 24, verse 27. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. When Jesus comes this time, John the Baptist will not be announcing him. In verse 26, Jesus said, Therefore, if they say to you, Look, he is in the desert, do not go out, or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. In the King James Version, the last part of verse 26 says, If they tell you, behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. Just the other night, uh, a friend of mine and I were walking back to Michael's dance studio after a successful visit to Starbucks. And as we walked, a couple of young ladies walking in the opposite direction smiled at us. They acted as though they knew us, which was kind of odd. And if you walk along Main Street in downtown El Cajon, there's a good chance you're gonna run into some Jehovah's Witnesses. They seem to be there all the time. I couldn't read the name tags that these young ladies were wearing, but I strongly suspect that they were the name tags that are issued to Jehovah's Witnesses who are evangelizing the public. We didn't have much time to talk with them. They did invite us to visit their church. I told them I couldn't make it. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses say that since Christ came in 1917, well, that's, yeah, he, he supposedly he came in 1917 into a secret chamber from which he now rules the world. Now, I have to tell you, if this is how God rules the world, I'm a little bit disappointed. They tell us that we have entered into the millennial age. Isn't it glorious? Well, the Bible tells us that during the millennial age, Satan will be bound. And if Satan is bound right now, it sure seems to me like his leash is just a little bit too long. <laughs> Verse 27 likens his second coming to lightning coming from the east and flashing to the west. The whole world will know there's not going to be anything secret about it. We used to live in Oklahoma and they get some pretty terrible storms there. Storms that make some of ours look like child's play. Tornadic storms often include tremendous lightning. 
if you've been through one of those storms, you know that a lightning storm is a very public affair. Everyone knows about it. Lightning storms can be very frightful experiences. The Lord's second coming will be like that. Nobody is going to need to announce it. When Jesus comes the second time, he's going to be coming to establish his kingdom on earth. And everyone's going to know it's happening. There won't be anything secret about it. Some call the next verse the most difficult to understand in the Olivet Discourse, which, as you know, contains it's contained in Matthew's chapters 24 and 25. So what does this verse say? Verse 28, for wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Now, he just told us about his glorious second coming and compared it to the flash of lightning. But now he switches to carrion eating birds. There are multiple competing interpretations of this verse. I believe this verse represents an allusion to the Battle of Armageddon, which is further illuminated in Revelation chapter 19. In that chapter, John tells us that heaven will open and a white horse will emerge. That horse will be carrying a rider, one who is called faithful and true. This rider will be clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name will be the Word of God. The armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, which is exceedingly white and clean, will follow him on white horses. John tells us that after this, in his vision, he saw an angel standing in the sun, and he, meaning the angel, cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them, the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. Once again, that's from Revelation chapter 19. Now, I've told you before about the hawk that likes to perch on our back fence as he enjoys his latest meal. Karen has seen this in vivid detail more than once. <laughs> and when the nations of the world come together for war in the Valley of Megiddo, carcasses are going to abound. Eagles and other carrion-eating birds will surely follow. The world system, with all of its pride, pomposity, and alleged power, will become nothing more than a dead carcass. A free meal for a bunch of scavengers. No matter how much political progress we might appear to be making, and it sure doesn't seem like we're making much right now to me, human governmental systems will always be corrupt because of human depravity. Things are very wrong in our society. As Hamlet would say, something is rotten in the state of Denmark. What's the answer, the solution? The answer isn't capitalism, it isn't socialism, it isn't communism. It's not democracy, it's not oligarchy, it's not anarchy. The only true answer lies in the return of Jesus Christ. That's the only hope we can look to in these dark days. Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses really have a, a tough time when they get to this passage. They really do have to do some double talking to immediately throw you off. They really don't like this scripture at all, because as we mentioned earlier, they say he has already come, but he's in a secret chamber, you see. Nobody saw him except their leaders, who are now getting their instructions from him. According to them, he's setting up his theocracy upon the earth right now, through them. Nonsense. Worse than nonsense. It's lies. It's deadly deception. So why will all the tribes of the earth mourn? The prophet Zechariah tells us, that when Israel looks at Jesus after his second coming, when they see the wounds in his hands, the Jews will ask him, where did you get those wounds? And Jesus will answer, I, will re I have received them in the house of my friends. 
at Zechariah chapter 13. Israel will mourn as they look upon the one they have pierced, and that will surely be crushing as they recognize their mistake. Verse 31, And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So the angels will gather the elect. Which elect? The Jews. Remember, Jesus is dealing with Israel in this section. People who believe the post-tribulation theory that Jesus isn't going to take out the church until after the great tribulation use this verse as one of the chief supports for their position. This verse is one of those compilations where Jesus put together three Old Testament verses in which God has promised that when the return of Jesus Christ takes place and the kingdom is established, God will again take back the Jews as his people, as a nation, and he will bring them back in the land and honor them once more. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, God spoke of returning them from their captivity. The Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you. Deuteronomy chapter 30. In Isaiah chapter 27, God again predicted the regathering of the people. O oh, you children of Israel, so it shall be in that day. The great trumpet will be blown. They will come who are about to perish in the land of Assyria, and they who are outcasts in the land of Egypt, and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount at Jerusalem. Jesus refers to that as well. And then let's look at one more Old Testament scripture. Isaiah chapter 11. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So in harmony with these other prophecies, we understand Jesus' prophecy to refer to the elect Jews, not to the church. Now Jesus is going to share another fig tree parable. Verse 32. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it, or it could be translated, he, is near at the very doors. What does that mean? It means that when you see the things that he has been talking about, the world wars, the pestilences, the earthquakes, the false Christ, the tribulation, you'll know that his coming is at the door. In scripture, the fig tree is used symbolically to represent the nation of Israel. For example, in Jeremiah chapter 24, the Lord showed Jeremiah two baskets of figs that had been set before the temple. One basket had good figs, like the first ripe figs. And I told you before about our neighbor's fig tree, which was near the house in which I grew up. And my dad loved that tree. When the figs were ripe, they tasted wonderful, but you wouldn't want to eat them before they were ready. And when they had been on the tree too long, they would split open. Wasps and other insects would swarm around them, and you'd have to walk on the other side of the street. And at that point, all they were good for was throwing at your friends. But let's get back to Jeremiah. So the first basket he saw had good figs. The other had bad figs. Jeremiah said the bad figs were very bad, which cannot be eaten, they are so bad. He went on to tell us that the good figs represented those who allowed themselves to be carried away captive into the Babylonian exile. The bad figs represented those who would try to avoid that captivity. Referring to the good figs, those Israelites who didn't try to avoid being taken into captivity, God told Jeremiah, I will set my eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them back to this land, and I will build them and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up. Then I will give them a heart to know me, so that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God for they shall return to me with their whole heart. That's from Jeremiah chapter 24. Now, if those who tried to avoid captivity, God said, I will deliver them to trouble into all the kingdoms of the earth for their harm to be a reproach and a byword, a taunt and a curse in all places where I shall drive them. And I will send the sword 
and the famine and the pestilence among them till they are consumed from the land that I gave to them and their fathers. And in Hosea chapter 9, God says, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first fruits on the fig tree in its first season. But they went to Baal Peor and separated themselves to that chain. They became an abomination like the thing they loved. There are other instances, but you get the idea. In scripture, figs or fig trees are repeatedly used as a representation of Israel. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 32 and 33, Jesus is saying, when you see the trees budding forth, you know that summer is getting close. So when you see the signs that he's been predicting, you'll know that his coming is close. We're not going to specify a date. Verse 34, assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things are fulfilled. That would be the generation that sees the signs to which he has referred. Verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. In Revelation chapter 21, John tells us, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There will be a new heaven and a new earth, but his word will never change throughout the ages. Verse 36, but of that day and hour, no one knows, no, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. Prior to 1914, Jehovah's Witnesses believed that the last days began in 1799. Jesus started being present with his people in 1874, and he started ruling in heaven in 1878. They believed that the times of the Gentiles would end in 1914, resulting in Armageddon, the fall of false religion, the end of all earthly governments heavenly and earthly resurrections, and paradise on earth. That is straight from their Watchtower edition of July 15th, 1894. Well, 1914 came and went. In hindsight, the Jehovah's Witnesses had to admit that their earlier expectations were wrong. They made adjustments to correct previous misunderstandings. In our day, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus had to wait until October 1914 before all authority was given to him. They say that at the time he became king of God's heavenly kingdom. He, they tell us by comparing conditions on earth since World War I, which was from 1914 to 1918, with Jesus' prophecy, one can see that he depicted conditions in our time. Therefore, Jesus must now be ruling in heaven. Only JWs are the true and loyal subjects of this heavenly king. There are so many problems with their misinterpretations, it's hard to know where to begin talking about them. <clears throat> of course, they believe that only 144,000 people since Jesus' time can ever go to heaven, there to be co-rulers with him over the inhabitants of a paradise earth. Now, if I was a Jehovah's Witness, I would be a little bit discouraged about that. As of 2020, they numbered nearly 9 million people in active service. <laughs> now, even if you use common core math, the numbers just don't work out. Don't waste your time trying to predict when Jesus will return. The Bible clearly says that nobody knows the day or the hour. The angels don't know it. Charles Taze Russell, the first president of the Watchtower Society, didn't know it. Not that it stopped him from falsely predicting it. Herbert W. Armstrong didn't know it. Jesus Christ himself didn't know it, at least during his earthly ministry. It's foolish for anyone to make specific predictions regarding the prophetic timetable. Don't listen to anyone who's predicting a date. But that all changes once the abomination of desolation has been set up in the rebuilt temple, doesn't it? <clears throat> Daniel tells us that Jesus will return 1,290 days after that in Daniel chapter 12. Now, I'm not planning to be around when the Antichrist is revealed, when the temple is rebuilt, or when the abomination of desolation is set up in that rebuilt temple. I'm going to be at a wedding feast in heaven. Now, if you're in Christ, you'll be there too. Why should we worry about the date or time of his second coming? We spend so much time thinking about that. Verse 37, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So like Noah, you and I are end times believers. 
Noah lived before the flood. We live before the fire. Noah spoke of coming rain, R-A-I-N. We speak of the coming rain, R-E-I-G-N. Just as it was in Noah's day, so it will be in the day of Jesus' second coming. What was it like in Noah's day? Genesis chapter 6 give us, gives us four parallels between Noah's day and the day in which we live. In the days of Noah, there was a population explosion. Remember, in Noah's day, men lived for eight or nine hundred years. There were billions of people on the planet when the flood came. In Noah's day, <laughs> abnormal sexual practices abounded. Most Bible scholars believe that Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, refers to falling angels, fallen angels having sexual relationships with human women. We too live in a time of abnormal sexual practices. Things that were unthinkable a generation ago are now commonplace and accepted. Did you know that more than 30 years ago, the hierarchy of the Episcopal Church began encouraging homosexual union as a pathway to personal holiness? We are certainly living in dark, dark days. In Noah's day, man's imagination, every intent of the thoughts of his heart, was only evil continually. Because of that, God lovingly decided to put them out of their misery. The flood quickly and mercifully accomplished the inevitable destruction that their sin and perversion would bring about. You can certainly say that the imagination of people in our society is continually evil. Estimates suggest that in the United States alone, the pornography industry annually generates between 10 and $12 billion in revenue. 35% of all internet downloads are related to pornography. And in the year 2018, users collectively watched nearly 6 billion hours of pornography. Now, if you've watched the news lately, you're aware that Jeffrey Epstein's associates list, well, most of it, has been released to the public. People from the highest stations in this life are on it. They are accused of heinous activities. In Noah's day, violence filled the earth. Remember, 2024 is an election year. The mass media have dropped every pretense of objectivity. So-called mainstream media outlets no longer practice objective journalism. They are now advocates for certain causes. They're trying to tell us that in this past year, violent crime rates have dropped substantially. <laughs> Take a good look around. Does it seem to you like our society is becoming less violent? If you want to come into contact with violence, all you got to do is take a trip on the freeway at rush hour. Mm -hmm. Only a very small percentage of criminals are ever brought to justice, and activist district attorneys have decriminalized certain activities. As a result, property crime has skyrocketed. And you can visit downtown San Diego today, and you'll see the results of persistent unchecked vagrancy and drug use. Violence is running rampant, even as justice is being hamstrung. Verse 38, for as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, Noah had been pounding on his ark and preaching to the people for 120 years. That's a long time. But they didn't listen. They must have thought Noah was all wet. And then 600-year-old Noah and his family climbed aboard that ark, which was built miles from the nearest body of water. Those mockers were then hit by the first drops of rain that had ever fallen upon planet Earth, probably wondering why the sky was leaking on them. <laughs> the Bible says that all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. It poured unlike any downfall we ever have seen for 40 days and 40 nights. Wow. Verse 40. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. There are two divergent interpretations of this passage. One says that those taken away are the unfortunate ones, being taken away for judgment while those who are left are the fortunate ones. The other interpretation is that this is a reference 
to the rapture of the church. Those who are taken away are blessed. Those that remain stay for the judgment. There are persuasive arguments for both positions, and you can choose whichever position fits your scheme. Verse 42, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Jesus told us that no man knows the day or the hour. Because you don't know the day or the hour, watch. He's going to catch a lot of people by surprise. They're not going to know. They won't see it coming. They won't be ready. Verse 43, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect him. When will Jesus come? If you're not watching, he'll come when you least expect him. I heard the story of a lady in Czechoslovakia who was in great despair. You see, she had recently discovered that her husband had been seeing another woman. She stood on her fifth floor balcony and wondered whether she should kill him or take her own life instead. She decided to do the latter. She jumped. Little did she know that at that very moment, her husband was walking on the sidewalk directly below, and she landed right on top of him. <clears throat> he died, she lived. You never know who might be dropping in, so watch. <laughs> if you are feeling despondent, discouraged, defeated, and depressed, know this, the Lord is coming, so watch. Verse 45, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master may ruler over his household? to give them food in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. What are we supposed to be doing in Jesus' absence? We're not to be sitting around, goofing off, or kicking back. Jesus says the wise servant is the one who is doing good. You say, but my doing good doesn't seem to be doing any good. I heard another story. This one is about a man who lived in the North Beach section of San Francisco. It's San Francisco's Little Italy area. It's also an area that has been known for sin and carnality of the worst sort. Many years ago, this man watched the neighborhood beginning to sink into sin. He began venturing out onto the streets, and even as barkers tried to pull people into their topless bars, he walked he talked to people about Jesus in the 1940s and the 1950s. He even wore a sandwich sign with a gospel message neatly lettered on both sides. Many years later, this precious old man was asked, why do you keep doing this? It's not doing any good. He replied, I may not be changing them, but though I'm doing this, lest they change me. He was truly a wise servant. Verse 48, but if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus gives us a very important warning here. Beware of the attitude which says, my master is delaying his coming. We must live in constant anticipation of Jesus' return. That means being about his business now. The most dangerous lie is not there is no God, and it's not there is no hell. Satan's most dangerous lie is there is no hurry. It's no small thing to say, oh, Jesus isn't coming today, or he isn't coming for several years, because that's what your view of hypocrisy requires. We need to be ready for Jesus' imminent return. The evil servant in this passage, who wasn't ready for the master's return, sinned greatly. He was not about the business that the master had left for him. He mistreated and fought with his fellow servants, and he gave himself to the pleasures of the world instead of serving his master. This emphasis on constant readiness is a challenge for today's Christian. You could say that many Christians aren't ready in those same ways. Everyone who reads this passage should be greatly impressed by the urgency of Jesus' appeal. The faithful and wise servant 
was rewarded, but so was the evil servant. He was rewarded for his wickedness, and he would have the portion with the hypocrites that he deserved. There's great danger in saying that the Lord is delaying his coming. Anytime someone declares that some other event has to happen before the Lord comes for his church, in essence, is saying that the Lord is going to delay his coming until the Antichrist is revealed or until after we've gone through the tribulation or some other thing like that. In effect, that person is saying the Lord is delaying his coming. And Jesus said, hey, you don't know the day or the hour, so watch and be ready. If you believe that the Lord will delay his coming until after some particular event, you won't be diligent in serving the Lord. The usual attitude, or the result of that attitude, is slothfulness. That's a dangerous position to be in when the Lord returns. You don't want to be found in the slothful state. Next time, we're going to study the second and last chapter of the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 25. And now I'd like to ask the worship team to come forward. Some of you have listened to John Corson teach. He's one of my favorite Bible teachers. And it's kind of shocking, but we just started 2024, and it was almost 30 years ago to the day when his daughter, Jessica, was taken to heaven. And uh, this was 13 years after his wife she was, she was killed in a car accident. And it was 13 years, almost to the day when, but after his first wife had been taken to heaven in a car accident along that same stretch of road. Three months after his daughter had been taken to heaven, John got a letter in the mail from his daughter. That's odd, isn't it? Well, she had gone to church camp several months before and one of their exercises at the church camp was to write a letter. And the letter was supposed to detail what they wanted God to do for them in the coming year. Well, that's interesting. And he said his daughter would normally write page after page of the things that, you know, he, she wanted God to do for him. For her in the coming year. So, but this time she only wrote five words. What do you want God to do for you in the coming year? And she wrote to take me to heaven. Mm. Mm. And he did that. So he answered her prayer. And now, as the worship team is leading us in song, that's what I want you to be thinking about. What do you want God to do for you in the coming year? We just, we just, I don't believe in New Year's resolutions, but think about what you'd like God to do for you in the coming year. And be thankful for the things that he has done for you in years past.
Now, if you want to read along sometime, you can look at this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when Jesus was, well, actually, Paul was rebuking some disorders that had begun taking place at the Lord's Supper. And he said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's partake of the bread together. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let's go take the cup. If you'll stand with us, please. great teacher used to tell us and yes he did this in class he told us to think of our lives as a test you know when you, when you take a test you have a sheet of paper that someday the test is going to be over so and they're going to take the paper back from you and they're going to grade you, right so he, that's how he told us to to watch and to be ready um so that is the challenge to all of us to watch and to be ready to be about the king's business for soon and very soon we are going to see the king yeah. and that will be a glorious day the lord bless thee the lord bless thee and keep thee and keep thee the lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee and be gracious unto thee the lord lift up the lord lift up his countenance his countenance upon thee and give thee peace may god richly bless you in 2024 and beyond in jesus name amen amen, amen.